Okay, move out. skies over Vietnam come the streaming eagles, the heroic paratroopers of the 101st Airborne Division. Their fabled exploits during World War II can never be forgotten. In December 1944, outnumbered and surrounded by the Germans at Bastogne, the men of the 101st courageously fought on. When the Germans ordered them to surrender or be annihilated, their acting commander, Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe, gave the historic reply, nuts. And they stood until the Germans were defeated. It is in this same tradition that the men of the Screaming Eagles 1st Brigade today serve on the jungle battlefront of Vietnam. On a warm spring day in 1965, several Army aviation companies arrive in Vietnam aboard the carrier USS Iwo Jima. It is the beginning of the Army's air mobility buildup, the first of the assault helicopters, which soon will fill the air over this embattled land. Even as the pilots of the 101st Aviation Battalion whirl away toward the field at Vung Tau, all of South Vietnam is infested with Viet Cong. From the north, they stream down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and like a disease spread throughout the Southern Republic. Into this setting come the first of the Screaming Eagles, the aviation crews of Company A, forerunners in the massive American military buildup to stop the communist enemy. For the Republic, this is a time of desperation. Here at Vung Tau Airfield, 40 miles southeast of Saigon, the job begins for these airmen. Along with helicopter crews from other aviation companies, the men of the 101st are to be processed for movement to their new homes in the forward areas of Vietnam. Their mission now is to create the helicopter bases from which U.S. Army forces can be flown into combat against the Viet Cong. Quickly now, they make ready. In the next 90 days, before the airborne infantry arrives, these men will do a man-sized job. On the 29th of July, 1965, the 1st Brigade of the 101st Airborne Division arrives at Cameron Bay. The brigade, with its supporting elements, is commanded by Colonel James Timothy, who is welcomed to Vietnam by Ambassador Maxwell Taylor. And by General William Westmoreland. In the ceremonies which follow, Colonel Timothy gets his first look at the strife-torn shores of Vietnam. And for the first time, the brigade unfurls the proud emblem of freedom over the land it is here to protect. To Ambassador Taylor, the occasion holds a special meaning as the one-time commander of the 101st talks to his son, Captain Thomas Taylor, now a member of the Screaming Eagles. Concluding the day's events, some of the airborne infantrymen stage a parachute jump for Ambassador Taylor and General Westmoreland. It is to be one of the few jumps these paratroopers will make in Vietnam. The Screaming Eagles descend toward the earth and the unknown hardships of jungle warfare they will face in the months ahead. Within two weeks after their arrival at Cameron Bay, the Screaming Eagles are sent northward on their first combat operation as they sail for Quinyan, 130 miles up the coast. 
It is mid-August, and the brigade hasn't yet had time to establish its permanent home base in Vietnam. While the Vietnamese are celebrating the Lantern Festival, the men of the 327th and 502nd are moving inland from Kien Yang to An Khe in the Central Highlands. Their mission is to clear and secure the An Khe area as a base camp for the U.S. 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile, which will be arriving from the United States in a matter of days. At Deomong Pass, overlooking An Khe, the landings begin. After months of special training at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, this is it, the moment every man knew would come. A Viet Cong main force battalion has been reported in the area, and the airborne infantrymen expect instant contact. But it doesn't come. The Viet Cong are evasive, biding their time. It is an anticlimax for the men. This is their first lesson in Vietnam. No big battles when expected. Instead, a nagging war of attrition with primitive booby traps and snipers, small unit actions and ambushes in the jungle. Only when he thinks the situation is favorable will the enemy show himself in force. So the long, hard task of ferreting out the communist enemy begins. And the Screaming Eagles are good at their job. By the end of September, they will kill 600 Viet Cong. It will be a difficult thing, and some of these airborne fighting men will die. But the job, for this time, will be done. As the advance elements of the 1st Cavalry Division begin arriving at Anke, they commence taking over the area secured by the Screaming Eagles. Finally, the men of the 101st Airborne are free to head south and establish their own home base in Vietnam. From An Khe and the Central Highlands, the brigade moves 170 miles to the coastal town of Phan Rang. This is to be their permanent camp as soon as it can be built. Though weary from their campaign in the hill country, they work throughout October until the base at Phan Rang has been set up. General Westmoreland visits the Screaming Eagles on Thanksgiving Day, 1965, and inspects the camp at Phan Rang. He is pleased with their performance at An Khe and congratulates them on a job well done. Even as he returns to Saigon, the brigade is conducting local search and clear operations. As the new year begins, the entire brigade is deployed to Tui Hua, 100 miles to the north in Fuyen province. Known as the Rice Bowl, this is the richest rice-growing region in central Vietnam. From this fertile area come crops to feed all the people of central Vietnam. But the Viet Cong have been seizing the harvest and collecting unbearable taxes from the frightened farmers. Now come the Screaming Eagles to protect the rice harvest and stop the Viet Cong. Codename Operation Van Buren. The orders read, search out the enemy in the Tui Hua sector and destroy him. This assignment will be tedious. The VC desert their dwellings and avoid confrontation with the Americans. Yet the district is infested with an enemy who makes night raids and continues to molest the farmers. The search goes on. Brigadier General Willard Pearson takes over command of the Screaming Eagles on the 29th of January, 1966. He steps up the pressure on the Viet Cong. Fire! Across the broad reaches of Fuyen province, the Viet Cong are pursued. For the most part, they evade capture and withdraw to disappear in hidden underground sanctuaries. 
In the wake of U.S. military operations, the enemy rice raids diminish. But the VC themselves mingle with the local people and often are bypassed, attacking our units from the rear at night. On 8 February, the deputy commander of the U.S. Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, Lieutenant General John Hankies, comes to Tui Hoa to personally evaluate the situation. What he sees convinces him that the enemy is well entrenched in the district, that it will require repeated efforts by the 101st to dislodge these communist guerrillas. Operation Van Buren becomes Operation Harrison. February becomes March, and daily the screaming eagles patrol the jungles and foothills surrounding the rice fields of Tui Hua. Enemy main force headquarters are located and hit by the U.S. Air Force with B-52 bombing raids. The men of the brigade go in to check the results and prepare field reports for Air Force intelligence. Daily they go out, and daily they return. In 90 days, the men of the brigade gain control of the Tuihua region. Now operating in small units, they kill 516 hardcore Viet Cong troops between February and April. The rice crops are saved. Once, early in March, the men of the brigade receive a surprise visit from one of Hollywood's movie heroes, Robert Mitchum. During this enjoyable interlude, there is talk about the glamorous girls of the film world. Mr. Mitchum is given the opportunity to fire some of the weapons of the real life heroes in Vietnam. In mid-April 1966, the second battalion of the 327th is left to guard the rice harvest at Tui Hua, and the rest of the brigade moves out on Operation Austin. Two weeks in the area around Phan Thiet, then onward to Nang Ko, near the Cambodian border. Here, where the Ho Chi Minh Trail enters South Vietnam, the Screaming Eagles meet the 141st Regiment of the North Vietnamese Army. For a while, the fighting is intense. The 502nd Airborne Infantry takes a number of casualties. It takes six days, from the 14th to the 20th of May, for the U.S. paratroopers to drive the North Vietnamese aggressors out of their positions in the foothills of Nang Ko. The Communist regulars are well-disciplined, well-equipped, and tenacious. In spite of heavy ground fire, Army aviators get in with their dust-off helicopters, and the wounded are whisked away to safety. This is the enemy. When he was captured, he was carrying a machine gun made in Czechoslovakia. He won't be using it again. As for his comrades, they have been put to rout, and in their hasty flight, they have dropped their arms. Over 100 of the North Vietnamese lie dead in the mountains. Victory at Nang Ko is ours. But for the Screaming Eagles, the greatest testing is still to come. Far to the north in Kantum province, the brigade launches Operation Hawthorne in the area around Dak To. Kantum is a forbidding wilderness lying in the foothills of the mountain country which marks the border of Cambodia. It is the first week of June, and the air is heavy and humid. Until now, the enemy has held sway here. Thirty miles north of the little town of Dak To, the airborne engineers erect a crude bridge. A few miles beyond lies an American Special Forces camp. It has been under siege by the Viet Cong for nearly a week. Supplies and ammunition are badly needed, and relief troops must get through. The first of the trucks, 
begins crossing. Near the bridge, the men of B Battery, 320th Artillery, prepare for another firing mission. Throughout the morning, they have rained howitzer shells upon the enemy forces attacking the camp. Now, with fresh supplies of ammunition, they're ready to begin again. Each time the shelling starts, the enemy withdraws his attacking forces to escape the punishing fires. When it is lifted, he regroups and again tries to take the camp. Despite week-long airstrikes by U.S. Air Force jets, the Viet Cong have shown no signs of withdrawing. But the artillery fire, directed by those defending the outpost, is having a telling effect. Screaming eagles are under fire. The enemy has come to silence the guns. Communist fire comes from everywhere. Out there, the enemy is creeping in. He will try to overrun the American positions. The waiting is agony. Then the enemy makes his move. This is it, live or die. Forefront, General Pearson, the boss here in hell. From Bastogne to Vietnam, the tradition remains unbroken, magnificent. The Screaming Eagle. A small part of Operation Hawthorne is over. Some of the men of the 101st will fight no more. But for this day, the bastions of freedom held. They came from the north, a full battalion. Their weapons, not ours, have been silenced. Throughout the oppressive days and nights of June 1966, Operation Hawthorne continues. In the violent conflict which rages in Kantum province, the Screaming Eagles repeatedly beat back prize troop units of the North Vietnamese Army. In 16 straight days of combat, the brigade envelops the 24th North Vietnamese Army Regiment, and more than 500 of the communist aggressors are killed. It is the largest single battle of the war for the men of the 101st. The bitter struggle to preserve the freedom of this little Asian nation is made more bearable as each man is enriched in spirit and strengthened in his resolve. At last, the fighting is done.
All the world had heard about the gallant Screaming Eagles and the battles of Operation Hawthorne. In recognition of their outstanding victory in Kantum province, the premier of South Vietnam, Nguyen Cao Ki, comes to the little town of Dak Tho. Premier Ki and the deputy premier express the gratitude of their nation in a way that fighting men can understand. These are some of the weapons taken from the enemy, the premier is told. In the hands of the communists, the arms of China, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Russia, and even a variety of United States, French, and British weapons, which had fallen into those same enemy hands. Living evidence of the North Vietnamese regular army, six out of the 22 taken alive by the Screaming Eagles. Premier Key confronts the aggressors. You are lucky the Americans have taken you, he smiled. On the 21st of July, following surveillance operations along the Laotian and Cambodian borders, the brigade returns to Tui Hua. A new operation labeled John Paul Jones gets underway. Its purpose is to open and secure a 16-mile stretch of National Highway 1 between Tui Hua and Vung Ro Bay on the coast. The accomplishment of this mission will speed up logistic support of the Tui Hua area by permitting ships to unload at the nearby bay. It begins with elements of the 502nd Infantry landing at the cliff-guarded Vung Ro Bay, where, without encountering resistance, they begin moving inland to link up with the oncoming units of the 327th. The inland forces push forward, securing the highway and sweeping the adjoining countryside. Supported by helicopter gunships, Helleborn assault troops clean out the operational zone within six weeks. By early September 1966, they have secured Vung Ro Bay and Highway 1 north to Tui Hua. Sweeping through the mountains, the brigade captures 40 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong and kills 209 others. While Operation John Paul Jones is still in progress, the engineers begin construction work on the connecting highway between Vung Ro Bay and Highway 1. The Screaming Eagles have done their job well, and a new seaport is born. In the weeks which follow, the brigade protects the rice farmers as they harvest some 17,000 metric tons of the precious grain. Once again, the Tui Hua sector becomes a battlefield, and the Viet Cong suffer heavy losses with 239 killed and 42 captured. Viet Cong have had enough. They are nowhere to be found. Eleven Vietnamese are found, however, in a Viet Cong prison camp. They have apparently received no medical attention while in the hands of the communists. Held by the Viet Cong for several months, their ailments range from open sores and skin infections to malnutrition. as well as deformities caused by unset broken bones. This man, a former Viet Cong who defected to the Republic and was later captured by the VC, cannot tell of his unspeakable nightmare with the enemy. On the 9th of December, the odyssey of the brigade continues. From Tui Hua, back up north to Kantum province. The Viet Cong have been cleared from Phu Yen province by this time and the Screaming Eagles are moved to the north in a record 48 hours by the U.S. Air Force.
The deployment of the brigade by means of parachute marks the first jump in more than a year for many of the men. But they're in superb physical condition, and the jump goes well. As 1966 draws to a close, the brigade descends upon Kantum province to take part in Operation Picket. Fighting side by side with Vietnamese army forces and militia, the men of the 101st once again will scour the countryside, finding and finishing the enemy. The operations in Kantum province continue until the 21st of January, 1967. Then, after more than a year's absence from their home base at Van Rang, the brigade is ordered back for a rest. It seems a long time since the LSTs first moved the brigade up to Quignon as they headed for their first combat around Anke. Now, the LSTs are taking them home. On the 26th, the last convoy rolls into camp at Van Rang. Brigadier General Willard Pearson welcomes the men home. It will be one of his last official acts as brigade commander. Two days later, General Pearson transfers command of the 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne Division to the new brigade commander, Brigadier General S.H. Matheson. The battle-hardened troops watch with solemn pride as Lieutenant General Engler pins the Legion of Merit on the uniform of their departing commander. So the Screaming Eagles bid farewell to the commander who led them in 14 combat operations from one end of Vietnam to the other. For the Screaming Eagles, as for the rest of the United States military forces in Vietnam, the valiant effort to keep that young nation free continues. However far removed from our shores, the conflict between those who cherish human dignity and those who would snuff it out affects us all. In this belief, the gallant men of the United States Army stand steadfast, not only in Southeast Asia, but wherever they may be asked to serve in freedom's cause.